Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Our speaker today, if you were not here uh, yesterday, is Dr. Jim Samra. He's a graduate of uh, Dallas Seminary. He went to the University of Michigan prior to attending here. Graduated with his THM here, went on to Oxford University for his PhD. Uh, His main responsibility as the senior pastor, as he has been for these last seven years, is to lead others in the worship of our God. Uh, He is married to his wife, Lisa, and uh, Lisa is the daughter of uh, Dr. John and Karen Grasmick, uh, who for many years uh, taught and served in administration here at DTS. And uh, I had them stand yesterday, but I didn't have Lisa stand. So Lisa, would you stand and let us recognize you today? Thank you. Wise women attend Dallas Theological Seminary, and she's one of those, and she graduated from here as well. So uh, ladies, uh, you can uh, watch. She she made it. You can make it. It's good. Uh, Jim recently wrote a book, God Told Me Who to Marry, Where to Work, and What Car to Buy, and I'm pretty sure I'm not crazy. Uh, His series this week is uh, uh, really engaging God. Uh, Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Samra back to our platform this morning? Yep, I'm still intimidated. So uh, (laughs) let's open again in prayer. I know that we had prayer ready, but uh, I have a hard time preaching uh, until I can go to God's throne in prayer. So would you indulge me and allow us to pray uh, one more time before we begin? Father, we are here in your power and your grace. Uh, Lord, there is nothing uh, that we can do without you. And so God, our words will fall on deaf ears and will be useless unless you come. Uh, But Lord, in your mercy and grace, you have decided that you do speak that you speak to your people, uh, Lord God, and that you have chosen to speak through your word and the proclamation of your word. And so we ask, Lord God, that you would be here to do that uh, and that all of our human finiteness and failings and weaknesses would simply point to your overwhelming grace uh, and power and majesty. And that at the end of this day, we might say uh, that Jesus is Lord. It's in his name that we pray, amen. I'm not a morning person. I've never been a morning person. That's just not my time of day. There are some of you who are morning persons. Praise the Lord. Thank God for you. That's great. Uh, That's not me. Especially this was true at university. I was at the University of Michigan, and I found when I began the University of Michigan, I thought, you know, I was going to be uh, smart about this, and I was not going to take any classes that began before 9 a.m. By the time I left the University of Michigan, I did not take any classes that began before noon. I knew better than to do that. Now, the problem was, uh, you know, university is great if you're not a morning person, except for the fact that I was part of a Christian organization called, at that time, Campus Crusade for Christ. And Campus Crusade for Christ had this really bad tendency to do crazy, radical things for Jesus, like hold leaders' meetings at 9 a.m. on Saturday mornings. I was like, what is this institution doing? Now, I was one of the leaders in the ministry, and so I felt an obligation uh, to show up to these leaders' meetings. And so one Saturday morning, I distinctly remember rolling out of bed. It was probably 9.05 for the 9 o'clock leaders' meeting. Now, it was not a football Saturday at the University of Michigan, and on a non-football Saturday at the University of Michigan, there is no other human beings awake on campus. And so I rolled out of bed. I'm as late as can be. I'm rushing across campus. There's nobody around. I mean, you can't see anybody anywhere. And I'm going to a building called the Michigan League. Now, lots of universities have a building like this as a place where alumni come and stay, where there are meeting rooms, campus organizations, those sorts of things. And so I'm racing across campus, and there's nobody anywhere in sight. And so I, probably 9, 10 at this point, and I go rushing into the Michigan League, and I look across the atrium, and over there is the elevator. I got to get to the third floor where Campus Crusade had their student offices. And I notice that the doors of the elevator are already open. I'm thinking to myself, well, of course they're open. I mean, nobody would be up this early in the morning. That's the elevator waiting for its first ride of the day. So at this point, I'm moving pretty quickly. uh, And so I'm running basically almost full speed towards the elevator. I turn to go into the elevator. And at that moment, I get the surprise of my life. Because apparently the elevator was not waiting waiting for its first ride of the morning. There was someone coming out of the elevator, which I didn't see at all. 
The first thing I know about the person coming out of the elevator is that this is a big man because I bury my face into his chest because I'm moving full speed. And I really, I literally plant my face deep into the man's chest. Now I'm not a tall guy, this guy was big. Now the other problem is I'm moving at full speed so while my core stops because I've hit him, my limbs keep going. And so at this point, I have completely implanted myself in him and I have him in a bear hug, arms and legs, completely wrapped around the man. Now, it's at this moment that I hear a voice coming from above me. Most most voices come from above me. This one was definitely above me. And the voice says, excuse me, young man. (laughs) Now, the moment I hear that voice, now I can't see his face. Remember, my face is in his chest. I cannot see his face, but I know the moment I hear that voice, I know exactly who it is I've run into. Like there's not a shadow of a doubt. The moment I heard that voice, I know, I know who this is. I know who I've run into. And the reason I knew is because I had heard that voice hundreds of times before, mostly in my nightmares as a child. I knew it beyond a shadow of a doubt. The moment I heard that voice, I knew who I'd run into. You know who it was? Darth Vader. (laughs) I knew it. I was absolutely convinced. I have run into Darth Vader. (laughs) Now look, at 9 and 10 in the morning, whatever it was, my brain was already pretty fuzzy. But if you run into Darth Vader, your adrenaline starts to flow. And so while my face is still in the man's chest, my brain begins to click in and the adrenaline flowing and three questions pop into my mind. First of all, why would Darth Vader have a big squishy chest? (laughs) Second of all, why would Darth Vader be at the University of Michigan? And then most importantly, isn't Darth Vader a mythical character? Like he's not supposed to exist. Well, at this point, I now have enough sense to pull my face out of the man's chest who I'm hugging. I look up into his face and I realize I've run into Darth Vader. Now, it was actually James Earl Jones, who's the voice of Darth Vader, who happens to be an alumnus of the University of Michigan, who apparently is an early riser. And James Earl Jones had been staying in the Michigan League and was leaving to go get breakfast when I go barreling into him full speed. Now, the reason I tell you that story is that you would have recognized his voice too. James Earl Jones has a very distinct voice, especially if you're a fan of Star Wars like I am. You would have recognized it immediately. Darth Vader's voice is very, very unique and recognizable. But the point is, is not only does James Earl Jones have a distinct, recognizable voice, but so does Mark Bailey. He has a recognizable voice. So does Ron Allen. He has a recognizable voice and a recognizable laugh, too, uh, that goes with that. But so do you. So do I. Our children our parents. In fact, if you're married, I would guess that you could recognize your spouse's voice on the phone within one or two words of them speaking. We have recognizable voices, each one of us. But so does Jesus. And this morning, I want to think together about Jesus's recognizable voice. So if you have your Bible, would you turn to the book of John chapter 10? John chapter 10. For our series this week, we are thinking about engaging with God. Yesterday, we talked about talking to God. This morning, we want to think about listening to God, recognizing and listening to God's voice. And we want to look at what I think is one of the most important passages in the scriptures, that talks to us about God's voice. And the goal for this week is to look at passages of Scripture that have meant the most to me in ministry and that I'm hoping will encourage you in the ministry that God has asked you to do. We look together here at John 
chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 3 through 6. The watchman opens the gate for him. This is Jesus speaking about himself. And the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. This is an incredibly important figure of speech. It's incredibly important imagery. And the first time that Jesus expresses this, the disciples don't understand what he's talking about. I think it's worth spending some time thinking about what it is that Jesus means here in this passage. You see, before I came to seminary, and even while I was at seminary, I was presented with the possibility or the theory that God doesn't really guide and direct his people. That what God does is he simply gives us instructions in his word, general moral admonitions that we are to follow, and as long as we don't break any of those rules, the decisions that we make in life, the paths that we follow in life, well, that's for the most part up to us and that God will bless us sort of whichever way that we go. As I have journeyed in ministry, this passage has become important to me as I have begun to realize that Jesus does have a distinct, recognizable voice and that he uses that voice to guide and direct us as Christians. And this has been incredibly important to me as a minister of the gospel. And I want to share a few observations with you from this passage to help open up what it is that Jesus is saying here. The first observation is that when Jesus says that he has a recognizable voice, I don't think he means here an audible voice. Jesus does have an audible voice. Jesus' audible voice is recognizable. It's distinguishable. When we will hear it, we will know it's his voice, but I don't think that's what he has in mind here. After all, in verse says, 6, it says he's using a figure of speech. And just like in Psalm 19, where it talks about the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, there is no language in which their voice is not heard. That's not a literal usage of the word voice. The heavens don't have a literal voice. What it means is as God's creation communicates something about God, and when the creation communicates it, you recognize it as being communication. So it is with Jesus, that when we talk about Jesus' recognizable voice, we're talking about a pattern of communication that can be identified as being from Jesus. So if you're here yesterday and you're listening to a sermon about the importance of being serious about prayer and something in your heart is telling you this is for you, you may have heard my audible voice, but it's really Jesus' voice speaking to your heart. If you end up having some situation where you uh, have to change out of one class into another because of scheduling conflict, and it turns out that you're sitting next to a woman in class who's already gone through breast cancer and you have just been diagnosed with that same thing yourself, you can see those circumstances as Jesus communicating comfort and grace to you. There was no audible voice, but it's no accident that you're now sitting next to that woman, that this is God speaking to you using his distinct, recognizable voice. If you're in prayer this morning, asking the Lord, am I supposed to quit my job? I'm trying to go to school and I'm trying to work and I'm dying doing both of these things. Am I supposed to do less hours at work? And while you're praying, you feel in your soul, no, keep going, I'm with you. That's Jesus' voice. It's not an audible voice, but it's still a distinct pattern of communication that can be recognized as having its source in Jesus. When I was a student here, Dr. John Hanna encouraged me to read a little pamphlet called Empty Racks and How to Fill Them. It's a story about the founding of Dallas Theological Seminary. And in there, Louis Spiri Schaefer, who's the founder of our school, tells about an important day, a day in which he was trying, still trying to make a decision about whether this school should be located here in 
uh, in the city of Dallas. And it was a very difficult day that he was going through. Let me share with you what Dr. Chafer said. He says in that little booklet, at four o'clock on a never to be forgotten morning, I wakened with a sense of deep foreboding with regard to the agreement reached in Dallas. It seemed as if an unbearable burden had been thrust upon me. Failure, probable if not certain, was the only thing I could see. And the forebodings the power of darkness could devise, and all the forebodings the power of, of darkness could devise came rolling like billows over me. In a great agony of spirit, I cried to God, saying that I could not go through the day without some definite indication of his will in the matter. If such an indication were not given, I should have to cable to Dallas, requesting them to discontinue the whole project. It was a Gideon's fleece, and just as clearly and quickly the answer came. Dr. Chafer goes on to tell that very morning, it was 4 a.m. when he began to pray, two things happened that day in the house that he was staying in that he said made it unequivocally clear that God was telling him, no, Dallas is the city for our school. We are here today because Jesus used his distinct, recognizable voice. It wasn't an audible voice. It was through the circumstances that happened that morning. But when they happened, Dr. Chafer, whose chapel we are sitting in, Recognize that as not being coincidence or chance. This is the voice of the living God. Jesus, the good shepherd, using his voice to speak to us. So the first observation, we're not talking about an audible voice, but it is a recognizable way of communicating. And so whether it's through the scriptures or through prayer or through circumstances or through a comment from a friend, whatever it may be, we recognize that the ultimate source of that is Jesus using his voice. And when you see it, when you hear it, you recognize it as being him. Second observation about this is that when we talk about Jesus' recognizable voice, we both mean that he uses it to call us to salvation and to guide us after we are Christians. Look in verse number three. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. That's referring to the moment of salvation. That if you're a Christian here this morning, you have heard Jesus' voice at least once in your life. It was the moment he called you to salvation. Nobody comes to salvation unless Christ calls us. And every single one of us who are believers in Jesus have heard his voice. Again, most likely it was not an audible voice. But there was something burning in your heart. There was something when the scriptures were read to you. There was something as the friend shared the gospel with you. There was something as you sat in that church. There was something where you felt and I felt, I'm being called to this. That's Jesus calling us by name. He uses his voice to bring us into the kingdom. But that's not the only thing he uses his voice for. Look at what verse four says. When he has brought out all his own, meaning after he's used his voice to call us to salvation, notice what he does. He goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. We recognize his voice when he calls us to salvation. But as our good shepherd, Jesus continues to go in front of us and lead us and guide us. And so what this passage is talking about is not just Jesus calling us to salvation. He's talking about Jesus leading us to a ministry opportunity, to a spouse, providing words of comfort in the midst of a difficult situation helping us to find a dissertation topic or a research topic. These kinds of things leading and guiding us through life. After all, that's the imagery of shepherd. One of the things that shepherds do is they find lost sheep. And thank God for that, right? We were lost sheep and our shepherd came and found us and called us by name. But we wouldn't think a shepherd was a very good shepherd if all he did was find lost sheep. And all the lost sheep were sitting around saying, well, anybody know where we get some food? 
Anybody know where we find water? Same thing is true of God. If all God did was save us from sin, death, and hell, which is absolutely amazing. Please don't get me wrong. But if that's all God did, we would not think he a very good God. If he didn't also lead us to ministry opportunities where we could use our giftedness. If he did not also walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death. If he did not also guide us through difficult circumstances. If he did not tell us how to endure in the midst of trials and circumstances. When Jesus says that he is the good shepherd, he not only calls his sheep to salvation, he goes in front of us, leading us and guiding us every step of the way. Let me give you an example. When I was 23 years old, I was fed up with the whole boy-girl dating process. Probably because I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> but about that time, I'm reading through the Old Testament. And I come across this passage where Abraham wants to find a spouse for his wife, or for his son Isaac. And so he says to the servant, go out and choose a spouse for my son. Now, if I'm that servant, that's a lot of pressure. Because you get the wrong daughter-in-law, you're going to hear about it from the dad for a long time. So what does Abraham's servant do? He says, Lord, you pick her. Find somebody for me. Now he's asking God as shepherd to guide him. Not just in some general way. He's like, look, I need, the, I need the lady. I need you to pick her. And so he asks the Lord, can you have it be the woman who comes out and offers to water my camels and then says this exact phrase. And Genesis 25 records that Rebecca came out, said that exact phrase, and Abraham's servant goes to her father and says, look, God's, God's done this thing, and he tells him the whole circumstances. And Laban says, well, if this is the Lord, then it's so be it. And he sends Rebecca back to marry Isaac. Now I'm reading that passage, and I'm thinking to myself, well, there's at least one other example of somebody who ended up with a spouse without going through the whole dating process. But at that point, a little voice in my head said, well, of course, God picked a spouse for Isaac. He's a patriarch. He's important. He's in the Bible. You're a nobody. <laughs> At that time, I was working at TI here in town, and God's like, you're just, not God, Satan was saying, you're just an engineer working at TI. Why would God bother with you? This matters who Isaac marries. It doesn't matter who you marry. And I thought that until I came to a passage in the New Testament that changed my life forever. It's in Matthew chapter 7. Let me show it to you. Matthew chapter 7. I think we have it here on the screen. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Jesus says, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, Jesus asks, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask them? And while I'm reading that passage, I felt in my soul this question arise. If I asked my earthly father for advice about who I should marry, would he turn me away? Well, the answer was no. This passage is saying, well, if your earthly father would do that for you, how much more your heavenly father? It says everyone who asks receives. Not just Abraham, not just Isaac, not just David, not just Elijah, not just Bible characters. Everyone who asks. And I thought to myself, well, if I can go to my earthly father for advice, why can't I go to my heavenly father? And so that day I made a decision and I asked the Lord if he would choose a spouse for me. There were only two requirements I asked of him. First, that he choose somebody that I didn't already know. And second, that he tell me who it was before I visually saw her. Because as a guy, I had enough experience with my eyes to realize they were not good decision makers. <clears throat> and so I asked the Lord if he would do those two things. And when I was 23 years old, sitting in Lamb Auditorium, uh, a girl was mentioned. I didn't know what her name was. I had obviously never seen her. She was mentioned in class and something in my heart said, that's who I've chosen for you to marry. Now it was a subjective, I grant you that. But from that moment on, the next day, that thought kept coming back. For six months, it kept coming back until I finally met her. 
The first time I talked to her, I talked to her on the phone. And in that phone conversation, I felt additional confirmation. Over the next 10 months as we hung out together here at Dallas Seminary, I felt additional confirmation until finally God told me, this is who I want you to marry. And Lisa and I got engaged. A year later, we got married and she's sitting right down here in front of me, a trophy and a a, a testament to God's willingness to guide. That's what Jesus is talking about in John 10. That's what our good shepherd does. He delights not only in saving us, but in leading us and in guiding us. This brings him great joy. I felt that he was, thank you. I felt that he was excited that I wanted his advice. I felt that he was glad that I had come to him. That's what Jesus is talking about. When we talk about listening to Jesus' voice, we're not just thinking about Jesus calling us to salvation. We're thinking about our good shepherd after he has called us by name, leading us each step of the way. Third observation and last one. When we talk about Jesus' voice, what we don't mean is you and I using human wisdom and calling it Jesus' voice. For example, if you're trying to decide what classes to take for next semester and you sit down and you talk to the registrar and that's a great thing to do and you talk with friends who've already taken those classes and you talk with family members or you talk with others and you look at your schedule and you lay it all out and you come up with a really great course schedule to take for next semester, that's fantastic. But that's not what John 10 is talking about. That's what any non-Christian would do if they were trying to choose their classes. John 10 is not talking about us using our own, albeit God-given wisdom, us using our own wisdom and making good, human, wise decisions. This is talking about a voice that is outside of us, that belongs to Jesus, that's recognizable as his voice, not our voice, that speaks to us through circumstances, through the scriptures, through prayer, through friends, however he may choose to speak. After all, again, think of the metaphor of shepherd. When you think about a shepherd and his sheep, when it's time to find water, the shepherd doesn't hand the sheep an instruction manual and say, let me teach you how to find water on your own. And when the sheep gets there, they rejoice that their shepherd taught them how to get there. No, what the metaphor means is the sheep doesn't know how to get there on its own. The shepherd goes in front and uses his voice to speak to the sheep, not the sheep's own sheep smarts, but Jesus' voice. Lisa and I have friends, their names are Drew and Erica. About six years ago, Drew and Erica are part of our church. They grew up in a nominal Christian environment. They're genuinely Christians, but not much more than that. West Michigan, just like in Dallas, we got a lot of that. Uh, A lot of people who are sort of going through the motions. That was great, but at some point, God called them to be part of the church that we're part of. And they got involved in the church and they began to get engaged in the church. And they had been living sort of the American dream. Drew had been working as an executive uh, at a local company in Grand Rapids. Erica was a nurse. They had at that point two beautiful children. They had just built their dream home. Everything was going according to plan. But God sort of pulled them into the church. And as they got involved in church and really began to engage with God and meet with God in a new way, They felt the prompting actually separately and then together that God was telling them to sell their dream home, their brand new dream home, and move closer to the church because they were too far away to really be engaged. Now, in Michigan, we've had a terrible economic crisis for the last four or five years. It was in the middle of this, and in the middle of that, it was a big housing crisis. To sell a brand new dream home that you had built yourself in the middle of a housing crisis, that makes no sense to anybody. But they felt like God was telling them to do it. So they put their house up for sale. In two weeks, the house sold. They moved into a smaller home, much closer to the church, and got engaged in the church. Well, a couple of years go by. And again, they grew up in Christian schools, Christian environment, whole thing. And so what they had done is put their children into Christian schools, and that was great. But at some point, both of them started to feel this pull that we need to take our kids out of Christian schools and put them into the public schools. Their family thought they were crazy. Everybody in their family had been to Christian schools. They didn't know any different than doing this but they felt like this was from the Lord. They didn't understand why or what he was doing, but they felt like the Lord was calling them to do that. And so they took their kids out of Christian schools and they put them into public schools. Kids struggled in public schools, but they felt like this was from the Lord. Last year, probably 15 months ago, Drew and Erica invited us to dinner. And they said, you're not gonna believe what we think God's telling us to do now. (laughs) 
We're like, what? We think he wants us to move to Africa. God was calling them to Zambia in Africa to go for two years to work at a school that was just getting started over there. They had never been to Africa. (laughs) They didn't know anything about Africa. But God was calling them there, and so three months ago, uh, Drew quit his job, Erica quit her job, they packed up their three beautiful little kids, got on a plane and moved to Zambia, Africa, and they're there right now. If Drew and Erica were here this morning, they would not tell you that they ended up in Africa by sitting down with a sheet of paper and listing the pros and cons. They would not have sold their house, put their kids in public schools, done all of this because it was the wise thing to do. Nobody thought it was the wise thing to do. They didn't use human wisdom. If human wisdom is the only thing that ever guides us and directs us, nobody's ever going to sell all their possessions and follow Christ. That's not not the wise thing to do. But it might be the thing God's calling you to do. And in their case, it was the voice of their shepherd leading them and guiding them. And now today in Africa, they would say, we had no idea that selling our house, putting our kids in public schools, and ending up in Africa was all part of a master plan. But what they will say is they felt like God led them each step of the way. He didn't reveal what the whole path was going to look like, but they would say right now, even though it's a very, very difficult point for them, that they are beside still waters, they're in green pastures, and that the way they got there was not figuring it out on their own, but listening to the distinct recognizable voice of our shepherd, leading them and guiding them every step of the way. I'm a pastor. Pastor is just another word for shepherd. People come to me all the, all the time. They want guidance. They want help. They want concrete, specific help with what to do in life. They're confused. What they're not looking for from me is just sort of general platitudes or an instruction manual or something just to tell them, go ahead and do whatever you feel like doing. These are sheep that are lost, that need direction and guidance. And I think to myself, how in the world could I possibly guide these people unless I'm being guided at the same time? Unless the good shepherd is leading me, how am I going to lead them? And one of the most important things I've discovered about ministry, it's impossible to be a shepherd unless Jesus is shepherding you. And part of what it means for Jesus to be our good shepherd is that he has a recognizable voice that he uses, that he'll tell us if we're willing to listen what to preach on. He'll tell us how to approach a counseling situation. He'll tell us what to do in a staffing situation. He'll tell us what to do when a friend comes to us in desperate need. He'll instruct us and guide us in ways that we're supposed to go. He'll lead us in educational paths. All of these things, this is what Jesus does. And if I could communicate anything to you, yesterday I wanted you to understand that when you go to God in prayer, amazing things happen. Today what I want you to know is that if you'll listen, He will lead you each and every step of the way, not in some sort of general kind of way, but as a shepherd leads his sheep using his distinct, recognizable voice to guide us. This is why I love that old hymn. All the way my Savior leads me. He takes me down each path. And the end of that song says, And when I reach heaven's journey, my song for ages will be, my Savior led me all the way. That's what John 10's talking about. That's what God wants to do for each and every person in this room, to be our good shepherd, leading us and guiding us through the days of life. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you are a God who speaks How miserable would we be, Lord, if you were silent? Lord, we can look back over our lives and see in what seemed to be just chance circumstances or a passing word from a friend or a seemingly random sermon. We can look back and see, no, no, that was you leading us and guiding us. Lord, none of us would be here if you hadn't led us to this place. Jesus, you deserve all of the glory. We didn't figure this out. I'm not standing here because I figured something out because I thought of something, because I planned this all out. Lord, our lives are a tapestry to your credit. They pronounce a shepherd that is good and wise and constantly guiding and leading his people. And Lord, I pray for each person that's in this room. 
Jesus, that your voice would be distinguishable and recognizable, that they might hear your voice echoing in their hearts and minds. And Lord, that each one of us, when we reach the end of our days, would have that same testimony, that you led us all the way. We praise you. We thank you. Thank you for being the most amazing shepherd possible. We love you, Lord. Amen.